Hey everyone, Dr. Hinky here. Uh, we are going to go through, as I promised, the second part of Chapter 4, just very quickly highlighting, and I'm going to tell you a little story about eukaryotes and how those organelles work together. Um, before we go through Chapter 5, looking at the eukaryotes that we are concerned with in microbiology, um, I am not going to read every single one of those and go over them. We've got a, a really good discussion um, that will help you. And also, I have loaded here in, in our Chapter 5 D2L, um, I have uploaded this. It's just a blank worksheet, um, but this is here to help you. You can download and print this, and it will let you kind of organize all of this information from the chapter. Um, so did that to kind of help you out in there. And let's um, take a look at our Chapter 3 eukaryotes and then the eukaryotes of concern to us in microbiology. Unique characteristics of eukaryotic cells. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I know a lot of you are really struggling remembering all of the different organelles. Hmm, I do want you to see the, the big picture here. So let me see if I can't get this to project the correct screen. Um, there we go. All right, so here is our, our eukaryote. It's our eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell. See, it's much more complex. It's going to be much larger than our prokaryote. Um, and the big difference here is that we have all these divisions inside this cell. And what I compared it to in the last video is our prokaryote is like a single room schoolhouse. Everything happens in the same space. Um, it can be confusing. Everything's going on. There can be interference. Um, so here, what we have is a classroom or a building more similar to what we'd find on campus at Trident Tech, where we have separate compartments, separate rooms, and separate areas for different functions. This is going to allow cells to get bigger, to do more things, because now we're not going to have to separate things out by what time they occur, when they occur, so that we don't have interference. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, but we can separate them out in space. We can be doing a lot more things in this bigger space. So the big you need to know all the different parts. A lot of these structures are going to come into play when we look at, um, at microbe-human interactions. So how do we get infected? A cell has to get in. How is it going to get in? Sorry, I'm flipping around here. I keep touching my mouse. Um, things are going to get in through the plasma membrane. So it's important to know the composition of that plasma membrane, how those membrane proteins allow things to move in and out. So if we look at our membrane, the outer membrane, the plasma membrane that separates the outer world from the inside, its function is to regulate what goes in and out. And what it is is a phospholipid bilayer. So break that word down, phospholipid, the lipid, those are fats. Um, the phospholipids have two long fatty acid tails and a glycerol head with a phosphate attached. So phospho and it's a lipid. Those phospholipids, the tails orient themselves toward each other because they're hydrophobic. They want to get away from the aqueous solution inside the cell and outside the cell. The only way to do that is if they orient themselves in in two layers and put those um, those glycerol heads toward the aqueous solution inside the cell, the cytoplasm, and outside the cell. Um, so that's why it's a bilayer. And then it's embedded with proteins. And those proteins, some act as channel proteins or carrier proteins that allow nutrients and ions in and out of that membrane. 
some things are small enough to move through the membrane themselves, but not everything. Um, some things are too big, some things have a charge, so they would get locked up in there and they can't get through, so they need a doorway. So some proteins are doorways. Some proteins are used for communication and connection in eukaryotes. Um, we have junction proteins that hold cells together. Uh, some of these are used as recognition proteins. We have proteins on the cell surface that are specific, they're the right shape to identify a specific molecule. So that's how hormones act on, um, on cells. Receptor proteins of the exact shape for that hormone and so it fits in there. It's also how our immune system recognizes what does or does not belong in our cell. Recognition proteins. Why we reject uh, transplants. Say, oh, this is not part of me. And they recognize that by those surface proteins. Other proteins in that membrane um, are used as receptors. So I guess recognition hormones. Receptors are really the, the correct group for hormones. They are able to receive the message from that hormone, not only recognize them, but also uh, receive them and maybe bring them into the cell or trigger another reaction. Uh, and the last group are enzymes. And enzymes are proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. They make them happen faster. So within a cell, to keep it alive, chemical reactions have to happen when they're needed, where they're needed. Uh, and if we just relied on chemical reactions happening in their own sweet time, meaning when two chemicals came close enough for their atoms to interact, uh, it might not be fast enough to sustain life. Probably wouldn't. Enzymes can increase the rate of reaction up to a billion times faster than they would occur otherwise. So that's the rate we need them to happen at to sustain life. So every chemical reaction in a cell is catalyzed by an enzyme. And each enzyme is specific to one chemical reaction. So if we have a complex process like cell respiration, where we're breaking down glucose um, to get energy, there are about 72 different steps in that. And each step has its own specific enzyme. Uh, so on the cell surface, we have those enzymes that catalyze chemical reactions. Uh, in a eukaryotic cell, we have enzymes all over the place everywhere. We do in bacterial cells somewhat too, but in bacterial cells, one of the ways uh, we keep chemical reactions from interfering with each other is because most chemical reactions in bacteria take place at enzymes that are part of the plasma membrane. Uh, so that's our membrane. Those are some of the functions of the membrane. The inner membrane, the thing that gives us compartments in eukaryotic cells that allows this increased complexity, um, is called the endomembrane system. And so uh, we've got membrane-bound organelles. The nucleus houses the DNA. It's a bound by a phospholipid bilayer. We call that the nuclear envelope. It's made similarly phospholipid bilayer um, to the outer membrane. It is a membrane. It protects the DNA. Uh, but it's constructed a little bit differently. It has nuclear pores because we have some things like RNA that need to get out of the nucleus, uh, so openings within that membrane. Um, and then it extends out. If you look closely, you see this membrane, whoop, I'm trying to point without moving. This membrane, oh, it's continuous. It continues to this folded, layered, convoluted kind of maze-like membrane. Uh, so this extends out to become the endoplasmic reticulum. So endo, inside the plasma, the cytoplasm, the endoplasmic reticulum, if something's reticulated, that means it's kind of zigzaggy like this, like a maze. Um, and the endoplasmic reticulum creates these separate little rooms uh, in our building here where specifically certain molecules are synthesized. And so that means synthesis, we're building molecules in here. Uh, and the endoplasmic reticulum that is closer to the nucleus is studded with ribosomes. 
and ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. Um, so that should give us a clue that the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it looks rough because it looks bumpy because it has ribosomes on it, the rough endoplasmic reticulum has something to do with proteins. Well, the proteins are built by those ribosomes that are on its surface, and then they enter into this space inside the membrane where they are, um, can be packaged into transport vesicles that carry them to wherever they need to go. The way those transport vesicles are made are we can just bubble off a piece of this endoplasmic reticulum. Um, so all of the membranes, that phospholipid bilayer, is the consistency of olive oil. So if you think about olive oil, if you put olive oil in water, which this is in an aqueous solution, um, you can get little bubbles. So we can pinch little bubbles containing whatever molecules we built in here and move those around. So that, uh, that little transport vesicle lets things move. So our rough endoplasmic reticulum is involved in uh, protein synthesis and packaging and moving around or in moving it around, transport around the cell. And then the parts of the endoplasmic reticulum that are a little bit further away from my nucleus don't have ribosomes attached. This is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And lipids are going to be um, made in here, some carbohydrates, but lipids will be stored and transported in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Where these tend to be transported to is this the third membrane-bound organelle called the Golgi apparatus. Right? So in any image, they tend to color code things. If it's the same color, it's part of the same structure. So here we can see this kind of teal color on the rough ER and on the smooth ER, indicating that's endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and the Golgi complex, or the Golgi apparatus, is a different color. It's gold. Still made out of a phospholipid bilayer, so still part of the endomembrane system. When molecules move from the rough and smooth ER through those transport vesicles that pinched off and broke off and made little bubbles to carry particles, um, they transport typically over here to the Golgi apparatus. The olive oil consisti consistency just like we can take bubbles and put them together and two small bubbles can merge to become a big bubble, those transport vesicles can break off into smaller bubbles and then merge into a bigger bubble. So they will merge with this Golgi apparatus um, and deposit whatever it was they're carrying. The function of the Golgi complex or the Golgi apparatus is to process and package those molecules into their final state to be delivered to where they're going to be used. In the endomembrane system, where things are going to be uh, used, or we're building things that are either going to become part of this external membrane, my plasma membrane, or they're going to be exported out of the cell. And so we're building things that we're going to um, deliver out of the cell. So the Golgi apparatus, once it's processed, whatever that molecule is going to be, it will break off a transport vesicle and move it to the exterior. It's a membrane, so it can merge with this outer membrane. Um, and through exocytosis, where it merges and then opens up and pushes those molecules out. It's an active transport process. Uh, so through exocytosis, we can deliver things out of the cell. So there are other components here. Um, lysosomes and peroxisomes are specific types of those transport vesicles, but they also contain, so they're pinched off from part of this endoplasmic reticulum here, from the rough ER. They contain proteins that have a specific job of breaking waste down. So lysosomes are sort of the general garbage, garbage can. They have enzymes that just break down cellular debris and garbage mistakes. Sometimes cells make things incorrectly. They have to get rid of the mistakes. Uh, peroxisomes specifically eliminate uh, toxic byproducts, uh, primarily from cellular respiration. 
and they'll break those down to non-toxic products and then scoop them, you know, move right to the membrane and eliminate them from the cell through exocytosis. Um, microtubules, microfilaments, these are all part of my cytoskeleton. That's how we move things around. I think of it like a little racetrack, you know, the little kids' racetracks that you can put together in a certain order and then take them apart and put them together in a different order. Um, all of these filaments are involved with moving things around the cell. And those are organized by these centrosomes, which are involved in um, building and managing the spindle fibers during cell division, during, during mitosis. Uh, and here we have the mitochondria. These are the powerhouse of the cell that make ATP because anytime anything is moving or being built, we need energy. Um, so that's what they do. Some eukaryotic cells have flagella, some have cilia, not all. In the human body, only males have any flagellated cells, and that would be the sperm cell. And the only part of our, well, the, the, the part of our uh, body that has ciliated cells, because these structures are used for movement, and our cells aren't really always moving around, but our respiratory tract is lined with cells that have cilia that continuously beat and sweep upward, and that's to remove debris to protect our lungs. Um, so we'll talk about the mucociliary escalator. That's how we remove bacteria from our respiratory tract, from our upper respiratory tract. Um, and we use mucus. When we get sick, we start to produce a lot of mucus, and those cilia start sweeping uh, to trap the mucus and then sweep them up, and we cough a lot of sputum out um, to get rid of that. So anyway, the story I was going to tell you about how these are all connected, how they work, just because we tend to memorize the names of these organelles and their function and don't really see that they all work together. So the story that I use in my 101 class to introduce these is something that we're all familiar with. Uh, female mammary glands and their function is to produce milk. So when an infant cries, hormones are released, mom says, oh, time to feed the baby, we have to produce milk. Milk's just not hanging out in there, waiting, stored. Um, all the time, and it's not produced by magic. It's produced by all the cells that line the mammary ducts. All of those, every single cell lining there has all of these parts. And so the whole process starts in here in our DNA that's housed in the nucleus. Our DNA has the instructions for every single thing a cell can do. Um, but not every cell has to do everything. My mammary glands don't have to pick up stimulus from light and transfer it into my brain to tell me how to see things. Uh, so even though I have all the DNA, a lot of it is turned off. Only the parts of my DNA that I'm going to use are turned on. So this cell that we're talking about being a cell lining the mammary gland, its job is to produce milk. So that's the part of the DNA that's still active. We can think of it like the DNA um, is a recipe card, is a recipe. So our DNA, an anal a good analogy for our DNA is that it's a, a cookbook, and each gene is one recipe. So now I know the recipe that I need is for how to build milk. So first thing I'm going to do is, well, my DNA can't come out from my nucleus, so I have to find a way to get those instructions for how to make milk out to where I can actually build it. So I'm going to transcribe that recipe, the one recipe from the whole book, onto a note card. That note card is called RNA. It's a single-stranded molecule that's small enough to fit out through these pores in the nuclear envelope. So now I have my single recipe. I don't need to carry that big cookbook around. I have my single recipe that can fit out through this pore. Well, what's milk made out of? Uh, milk has casein, which is the protein found in milk. It has lactose, which is the sugar found in milk. So it's got sugar, it's got proteins, and we know it's fatty, too. It's high calorie for nutrition for the baby. So we have uh, lipids, and we have proteins, and we have sugars. So we're going to bring that recipe out here, and we're going to come to the ribosome. And the ribosome is going to take that recipe card and it's going to translate it into proteins. 
That's what the recipe is for, proteins. So we have a recipe for casein for my milk protein. And then we're going to have recipes to build the enzymes that are going to make the sugar and, um, and the fat. Because right? every chemical reaction is mediated, sped up by an enzyme, and enzymes are proteins. So now, in my endoplasmic reticulum, I have my milk protein that's going to get stored in a little package, and it's going to find its way over here to the Golgi apparatus. And then I have some proteins that are enzymes that are going to tell me how to build my lipids and carbs, and that's going to happen in my smoothie R. So they're going to move over here to the smoothie R, and those enzymes are going to build the carbs and lipids. And then those are going to be packaged. So we pinch off this little transport vesicle from my endoplasmic reticulum from the smooth ER, and I'm going to move it to the Golgi apparatus. Here, the Golgi apparatus processes the molecule into its final form. So it's going to take the sugar and the protein and the fat and put them all together. I'm no longer going to have a protein, a sugar, and a fat. We're going to put it all together, and I'm going to have a molecule of milk. So we're going to process it, and then we're going to package it into a delivery package that is going to carry that milk out to the membrane, fuse with the membrane, and through exocytosis, release that molecule of milk out into the mammary gland duct. So baby gets fed, and that's happening in every single cell, and it's not just one that's going to happen over and over again, so each cell is going to deliver hundreds of thousands of molecules of milk through this process, um, but that is how a cell does its job. In that example, the job is to produce milk, and that's how the endomembrane system works to get that done. Similar process through endocytosis and exocytosis, I'm constantly using up and uh, removing bits of this um, plasma membrane, so I have to constantly re replenish it. Well, it's a phospholipid, so I need to build those phospholipids in my smoothie R, and it has embedded proteins. So I have to build those proteins here in my endoplasmic reticulum. And then I can move them out and replenish my membrane. So that's how that endo, um, endomembrane system works. All right, so I hope that helps kind of to have you organize your thoughts um, and remember a little bit better what these different structures do. Uh, and we will come and look back at them some more. Primarily as human eukaryotic cells and what happens when we have, um, when we are infected, whether it's with a bacteria, uh, a virus, a toxin. Um, those parts are going to come into play either to help us or because that's what's going to be attacked. Um, so, onto the eukaryotes of, eukaryotes of microbiology. There is a lot in here, and I'm not going to go through every single one of the organisms uh, that are talked about. I'm going to hit the highlights of the groups that we're interested in, the protists, the helminths, and the fungus. Uh, so I'll leave, you'll have the PowerPoints. I'm going to leave it up to you to go through those in the chapter, and the discussion is really going to help. All right, so our objectives for protozoans summarize the general characteristics of the unicellular eukaryotic parasites, the protozoans, describe their modes of reproduction, uh, and then look at two specific examples of protozoans that move through pseudopods. These are amoeboid protozoans. If you think about amoebas, they move by cytoplasmic streaming. They, they push out that plasma membrane and cytoplasm streams into it, and then they use that to anchor themselves and pull themselves along. They move like the blob. Describe some intracellular protozoan parasites that are not motile. So in their adult form, they're not motile. Some of these have motility uh, in their larval or juvenile stages. Um, and so we'll look at these, Plasmodium, Cryptosporidium. Plasmodium causes malaria. Cryptosporidium is pretty much the most, one of the most common causes of gastrointestinal disease caused from 
like swimming pools, uh, and toxoplasma, which if you, uh, those of you who have kids may, may remember during pregnancy, you're told not to clean the litter box. Toxoplasma is a common parasite in mammal intestines, um, including in cats, and so it's found in their cat litter. It is isn't completely and totally innocuous and non-harmful to humans. Um, if you've had cats all your life, you've been exposed to it, and you are not going to have any issues with it. But fetuses are highly susceptible to some very severe adverse impacts um, if they're exposed to it, and that's why you're told not to clean the litter box. Uh, Valentidium is a waterborne protozoan that has cilia. And then we have some flagellated protozoans, Giardia, Trichomonas, and Trypanosoma. Um, so we'll take a look at first overall our protists. Um, within the domain of eukarya, so all our eukaryotes, we have the kingdoms animal, plant, fungus, and then we have the protista. So the protists are this group that is primarily all single-celled organisms. They are unicellular um, eukaryotes. The other groups, plants, are identified as plants by how they acquire materials and energy. Photosynthesis, uh, they make their food. Animals have to go out and eat something for their food. And fungus release enzymes into the environment around them and break down uh, decaying or ma organic matter, and that's where they get their nutrients from. Protists are this weird group. The, proti the protista that, um, kingdom includes all these unicellular organisms, and they are not unique in how they obtain nutrients. So some of them, they're all unicellular. That's what they have in common. Some are animal-like. They have to eat. Some are plant-like. They photosynthesize. Some are fungus-like, like water molds. Um, they are saprobes. They release, uh, they release enzymes. Oops. We don't want to see that. We want to see the screen. Where are we? Here we are. Um, they release enzymes and they break things down in the environment and absorb them. Uh, we also have another group that are photosynthetic. Algae fall into this group, even though there are some macroalgae, very large. Most are single-celled, uh, but they don't have the same structures that plants do, even though they're photosynthetic. So they're lumped into this group of protist protists. Within the protists, those that are animal-like, meaning they eat, are classified as protozoans. So zoa, when you see zoology, study of animals, these are animal-like. Unicellular, um, they vary in shape. They don't have a cell wall. Most of these are harmless. They're free living. If you go scoop up some pond water, you're going to get lots of these. See, what are you going to find? Protists, single-celled organisms, protists, free living pretty much everywhere. The ones that we are interested in um, are the parasitic ones. And some of these are animal parasites that are passed by insect vectors. So a vector is a, um, a living carrier of a disease that can spread it. So arthropods are our most common ones, mosquitoes, where they are not the cause of malaria, but they carry plasmodium, which is the cause of malaria. So the mosquito is the vector, but the parasite is the protist. So all of the ones we're interested in are heterotrophic. They need nutrients. They eat them. They don't make them. Um, and they feed by engulfing other microbes in organic matter. Some more characteristics. Most have some way to move, and that's how we tend to categorize them, by what structure they have for movement. A flagella. Eukaryote have flagella that are different. They work differently than bacterial flagella. Remember, bacterial flagella turn like a propeller. These move in a whip-like motion. Cilia are short hair-like projections that will um, cover a cell, and they will move sort of like oars on a boat. They'll move in unison. They'll beat to make the organism move. Pseudopods I described, 
and a few are sporozoites, meaning as adults they don't have any way to move. They need to be carried and moved. Uh, the protists typically have two parts to their life cycle. One is called a trophozoite. This is the motile. This is where they can move around and they're feeding. So if we look at the word zo, animal, and then trofo, think trophic levels. What's a trophic level show? Where do we see trophic levels? In food chains. And the trophic level you're on tells what you eat. So our trophozoite is the feeding stage. Most of these can enter a dormant resting stage uh, in the form of a cyst. Cysts are very resistant. They're similar. Uh, they have a similar function to the endospore that we saw in bacteria. There are a few protozoans that only exist in the trophozoite phase, but this cyst stage is really important um, in the transmission of our protists, our parasites. A lot of these can survive through stomach acid, so they're passed on through ingestion, through the fecal oral route is how we have transmission. You ingest them, they survive your stomach acid, they grow uh, in your intestine, and then they are transmitted on uh, in the feces. Uh, let's see. All of these are able to reproduce asexually through mitosis. One cell divides into two. And then we have two individuals because they're single-celled organisms. Some multiply through multiple fission, schizogony. Um, in this case, they will uh, divide their nucleus multiple times and then divide the cytoplasm between those um, individuals. So we don't just go from one to two. We can go from one to many. And many also reproduce sexually. So they are male, male and female come together, and then they have offspring. They produce gametes, and through those gametes, they produce offspring. Another thing that these are capable of, um, that when we talk about microbial growth, we'll see, a, or genetics, we'll see a similar process. Some protists can change, exchange genetic material through conjugation. We think, oh, conjugation, you have conjugal visit sex. Conjugation in protists and bacteria is not sexual reproduction. This is asexual, it's not a male and female, but it's two individuals of the same species who get together and they come in close contact with one another and they exchange parts of their DNA. So they just come into close contact, contact they make a copy of some of their DNA and then they exchange that through their cell membranes um, to each other. What happens afterwards, you don't have offspring. This isn't reproduction to produce offspring. This is to get genetic variation. Uh, so what happens is both of those individuals that came in, when they're done, they have completely different genetic makeups than they did before conjugation. So this is not really reproduction, but it's a way to get more um, genetic variation in a population. And in our next chapters, we'll talk about why that's important. And so this image is just showing that you know we can exist. We exist in both stages. We can exist at the same time. So here we have Giardia lamblia. This is a waterborne, um, a waterborne intestinal disease, you get giardiasis, it's sometimes called hiker's disease because it's common to get it from outdoor streams where there's wildlife or like pig farms or chicken farms nearby. Uh, but these you see are the trophozoites, they're active feeding stages with flagella, and here I have my cyst, my dormant cyst. All right, so as I said, I'm not going to go through my, exact, my examples, it talks about entamoeba histolytica causes amoebic dysentery. It's an amoeba. It moves through pseudopods. Um, Nigleria fowleri. This is often called the brain-eating amoeba. It causes a fatal brain infection. Uh, so be sure in the discussion to read posts other than just the type of protist that you are going to research. Um, this is an interesting example that comes up in the news most summers around Charleston. 
Uh, some non-motile examples include plasmodium, which causes malaria, um, and it's spread through a mosquito. And this goes into some of the symptoms. Cryptosporidium, it's con transmitted through contaminated water, really, really common when you have outbreaks of diarrhea um, in kids in the summer and find that they were all at the same swimming pool. This is the guy that's responsible for that. And then toxoplasma, as I mentioned, from cats or also raw beef. Uh, make sure when you watch these, uh, go through the PowerPoints, that you put them into uh, slideshow view and take a look at those videos. So you can actively play those videos right on the screen. Our one example of a protist that can cause disease in humans uh, that has cilia, the valentidium can cause dysentery. Um, that's our one example with cilia, I think. And then through flagello, we have Giardia lamblia, hiker's, uh, hiker's disease, or hiker, hiker's diarrhea. Trichomonas vaginalis, this is a sexually transmitted infection. And trypanosoma, this is African sweet sleeping sickness, or Chagas disease. Um, and they're slightly different, the same genus, different species, similar symptoms, they're related, uh, different vectors carrying them, because they occur in different parts of the, of the globe. The helminths, when we're talking about helminths, we're talking about Parasitic worms, so we're not looking at microscopic single cell, we're looking at worms. Uh, we're going to compare the morphology and some main characteristics. And then these are the nematodes, the roundworms that we're interested in, Ascaris, Enterobius, Nicator, Trichinella, and Dracunculus. Um, so you want to look under the micro connections for Dracunculus. And then look at the characteristics of trematodes and cestodes. So our trematodes are flukes or flatworms, and our cestodes are tapeworms. And the nematodes are roundworms. So you should see those three main classifications. So in general, oh, there's a cestode, a tapeworm. Uh, parasitic helminths are included because we identify them and typically they are transmitted not as this big old worm that we can see, we wouldn't ingest that, but through their microscopic eggs and larvae that we might not see them ingest accidentally. These are multicellular organisms and they parasitize host tissue. Uh, these usually have a mouth part that's designed specifically to attach onto something. In this case, this tapeworm. Uh, the scolex, this head region, is specifically designed to latch on to the intestines, to the inside of the intestine. We're going to latch on, um, and we're just going to absorb through diffusion. We're going to absorb nutrients from your stomach. They're not necessarily eating our food. It's not why you lose weight when you're infected with a tapeworm. Um, so they are absorbing nutrients, but they're not absorbing so many that you're going to lose weight. The reason you lose weight is when that latches onto the inside of your intestine, your body responds. It's trying to get rid of whatever that irritant is by producing lots and lots of mucus, um, which prevents the absorption of nutrients by your intestine. So this guy's not necessarily eating your nutrients so much as preventing you from getting them. Um, and then he eats them. Um, that also contributes to why you have diarrhea when you have these uh, intestinal parasites. So they're multicellular, they have mouth parts for attachment. They have well-developed sex organs that produce egg and, eggs and sperm. Uh, so when these are adults and they've latched on and they're growing, each segment of tape on this tapeworm, all the organs in it will be lost except the gonads, which will just produce lots and lots of eggs and sperm. And then Every time you defecate, little pieces of this will break off and be passed um, in the feces. So fertilized eggs then go through a larval period. Sometimes it's in the host body, sometimes it's out of it. Uh, before they're, So that's a juvenile stage. They are not able to reproduce until they're in their sexually mature stage. 
within these adult organisms, the sexes can either be separate, so they can be dioecious, meaning each individual is either a male or female, uh, or the same worm, you can sometimes see it referred to as hermaphroditic, but monoecious, both sexes are in one body. Their life cycle is typically eggs grow into a juvenile larval form. This is unable to reproduce, it's juvenile. That matures into an adult. So that adult is a sexual, uh, sexually mature, reproductively um, mature adult. So that's what the adult stage means, it's able to reproduce. So we talk about Definitive hosts and intermediate hosts, a lot of these in their life cycle, have to pass through two different hosts. And if that's the case, the intermediate host is the host where the larval stage develops, where the egg becomes a larvae. And then from there, it'll have to be passed on to a definitive host where sexual maturity and mating occur. Uh, so the definitive host is where it reaches sexual maturity and then produces those eggs, they get passed on, and then an intermediate host will pick those up and it will develop into a larvae. So we classify these according to the shape, size, organ development, uh, the mode of attachment, and other specialized structures, as well as the appearance of the egg, and the appearance of the larvae. Uh, and we identify them through microscopic detection. So we take a sample of someone's feces, usually, and look for those eggs or worms. Um, our groups, roundworms, nematodes, usually have a round. If we cut them in cross-section, it's going to be round. They have a complete digestive tract, meaning it runs from mouth to anus all the way through the body. Uh, they'll have a protective surface called a cuticle, which is different than a cell wall. It's um, it's not as structured and not as complete as our cell wall. We don't call it a cell wall. It's not on every single cell. It's just an external structure. Uh, many will have spines, hooks on the mouth. And then the excretory and nervous systems are usually poorly developed because once they're where they're going, they're not going to be moving around. They're not going to respond to the environment too much. Their main job then is to reproduce more eggs and sperm to spread. Uh, flatworms, our platyhelminthes, are, don't have a, a definite body cavity. Their digestive tract doesn't go mouth to anus. It's really a simple blind pouch, mouth to just a gut pocket, and a simple excretory and nervous system, um, possibly through diffusion of wastes. So cestodes are our tapeworms and trematodes are flukes, or flattened worms. These aren't segmented like the tapeworms. The tapeworms are, are segmented, and those little pieces will contain eggs to break off. Uh, and these will have sucking mouth parts on our trematodes. So our nematodes can be intestinal nematodes. Ascaris pinworm, anybody with kids, you might be familiar with pinworm. It's pretty common. Uh, and if you're not, go walk down um, any of the drugstore aisles looking where they have medications and you're going to see all sort of Pinex, Ridpin, all sorts of medications made to get rid of these because it's just one of the most common, most kids are going to end up with pin, pinworms at some point. And when you read about the life cycle, you'll see why. Uh, now and then uh, we have nematodes that specifically infect tissues and that's tricky. Conculus, Draconculus, Dracula. Um, Ascaris, if you have pets, you may have seen these. These are pretty common. Ascaris are kind of really common worms. Um, Entrobius, the pinworm, yes, read about this life cycle and how this happens in kids. Kind of, again, fecal oral root, uh, usually once. Uh, one child gets them, everybody in the family gets them. Adult immune systems tend to get rid of them pretty quick. Um, but yeah, pinworms are fun. There's my life cycle of a pinworm. 
Nicator is the hookworm. It's transmitted through the soil. Trichinella, this is uh, why you always hear, make sure your pork is cooked to 170 degrees on the inside um, because we want to kill this or it gets passed on through uncooked bear pork meat. I don't know anybody who eats bear, I don't know, bear. but anyway, it gets passed through uncooked, undercooked pork and bear meat. Uh, Dracunculus, the guinea worm. You can read that case study. Uh, can, you can YouTube videos on all these, and they're fascinating. I really, really, really is, is kind of the ick factor that's involved with this is high. You're going to squirm while you're reading this, but it's really fascinating, and I highly recommend you take a parasitology class. Um, it's offered at uh, College of Charleston and MUSC both have um, parasitology classes. Our flat words, flatworms, trematodes are flukes. These are usually, their common name reflects what uh, tissue they go after, so liver flukes, lung fluke, blood fluke. Uh, and then cestodes are our tapeworms. And I will let you go through these and report on them in the discussion. And then our last type of eukaryotic cell that we're concerned with in microbiology uh, are the fungi. So, so I have to tell this, I promised my husband I would tell this every time I teach fungi in microbiology. A mushroom walks into a bar. Bartender says, we don't serve your kind here. The mushroom says, why not? I'm a fun guy. <laughs> okay, joke of the day. Uh, so, we talk about why are fungus, yeasts, and molds, why are they studied in microbiology? Uh, we'll define the term mycosis, describe unique characteristics of fungus, um, talk about how you, yeasts reproduce, uh, and look at unique features of the fungal cell wall. So, oh, and then we've got some examples of specific fungus. Again, you can choose some of these to talk about uh, in the discussion and then read through one another's discussions to learn more. And we're going to also talk about uh, fungus as plant pathogens, as decomposers, and how this can affect you. That's in the book. We're not going to talk about it here. So. We think of fungus and we think of mushrooms, what's on our pizza, yay, uh, what's growing all over my yard right now with all this rain. Uh, but we also have microscopic fungus. We have spores, which are reproductive structures, single cells that are spread through the environment that spread fungus. Uh, and molds and yeasts, yeast is also single-celled organisms, so that yeast you put in your bread dough to make the uh, bread rise, that yeast is a single-celled fungus. It's a living organism. Uh, so it's been freeze-dried, and it's in that package in a dehydrated, desiccated form. So you add moisture and give it some food, uh, like flour, it germinates and begins to um, to ferment. Well, to use cell cellular respiration until there's no oxygen, and then it ferments. Uh, and that's why your dough rises, because as it ferments, it releases carbon dioxide. And so the dough rises because of those gas bubbles. And then when you cook it, bread smells a lot like a brewery, because that fermentation is releasing alcohol. Uh, so that's yeast, our single-celled um, organism that produces through asexual reproduction. Molds are multicellular, made of long filaments. These are called the hyphae. Um, and this is, if you think about bread mold, all that long fuzzy stuff. Some fungus are dimorphic, so they can sometimes be just a single-celled fungus. Sometimes they can be multicellular, and it just depends on what the environmental conditions are on which shape they're going to take. So our, our fungal cell walls, fungus all have cell walls. So this is a eukaryote that has a cell wall. Animal cells do not, but plant cells do, and fungal cells do. Those are made of a different substance than bacteria. So remember, bacterial cell wall is peptidoglycan. Uh, in plants, it's cellulose. 
in fungus, the fungal cell wall is made of chitin. So different from plants, different from bacteria. So these, chitin and cellulose, are both carbohydrates. Our peptidoglycan is a carbohydrate, a sugar, along with some amino acids, that peptide portion that holds it together. The membranes in fungus contain ergosterols, whereas animal membranes contain cholesterol. Uh, the sterols, this lipid component of cell membranes, its function is to make sure your cell membrane maintains the same consistency regardless of the external temperature. So we want it, we want those membranes to always be the consistency of room temperature olive oil, um, whether it gets hot or cold outside. And that's what sterols do, is they stabilize that membrane. Because these are different in fungus than they are in animal cells or plant cells, Anything that's different from our own cells makes that a good target for drugs. So prokaryotic structures that we don't have or that are different from ours, so the ribosomes are different in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, if it's different, it's a good target for antibiotics. Antifungals can target these. It's harder to target, um, to have specificity with fungus because they're eukaryotes. So they have the same similar structures to our cells. So we have to look for differences. Same thing with the protists. So our fungal structures, hyphae are these long chains of cells. This is what gives our fuzzy appearance to the threads to our bread mold. Uh, some of them are septate, meaning there is a distinct cell wall across in between each separate um, cell. Sometimes they're non-septate or they'll only have part of a cell wall. It won't go completely across. It won't separate it out completely. This allows for the flow of nutrients um, from one part to the other very quickly. So not divided cells. Vegetative, the hyphae, these long thread-like branches, some of them are vegetative. means they digest and absorb nutrients and grow. And some of them specifically produce spores as a method of reproduction. So here we see these kind of thread-like fingers on this fuzzy ball. Each dot is a spore that can reproduce, that can germinate into um, a new fungus that can grow into one of these hyphae, these threads. So these are conidia, this cone on top filled with spores. And so some of these hyphae are just going to sprout out. So this is the hyphae here and here. And end up with spore producing structures on the top. So these are our mold spores. They can be dispersed through the environment. So here is my hypha. There's my spores. There's my hypha. And there's my spores. These can be spread out, find a new place to settle, and then germinate into more hyphae. When I look at yeast, uh, what I'll see, they're single cells, but I can grow them on, an og on a saborid auger plate. So it's a special type of auger used to grow fungus, grow yeasts. They like a slightly acidic environment. Uh, and when they grow, they're going to have this creamy, uniform texture. They're going to reproduce through budding. So each cell, they'll divide very similarly to binary fission in bacteria, but it'll be unequal. So they'll just bud off. Uh, and sometimes as they bud, they'll stick together. We call these pseudohyphae. They're not really a long chain. They're just not separating completely. So fungus are heterotrophs. They have to eat. What they eat is dead and dying organic matter. So most are harmless. They live in the environment. Thank goodness for them because they break down dead and decaying organic matter in the form of feces, dead trees, leaves, leaf litter. Uh, they break all those things down and recycle those nutrients back into the soil so plants can grow and we can start life cycle all over again with animals eating them and us eating those animals. Uh, otherwise, all that leaf litter, plant litter, feces would just overwhelm the planet. So these guys recycle those nutrients. So they're good. 
The parasitic versions, not so good. They live on or in tissues of other organisms. None of them are obligate parasites. They don't have to. They can live on other, um, other organic structures, organic food sources. Uh, so the fungus penetrates into the substrate, secretes enzymes that break down organic molecules, and then they absorb the nutrients. Uh, and then again, I will let you read about the different types of fungal infections, specifically aspergillus. Uh, this is probably the most common cause of asthma is aspergillus. Um, we can inhale the spores, lead, can lead to aspergillosis, where that single-celled spore, remember dimorphic, they can exist as a single cell like a yeast, or they can be um, multicellular hyphae in immunocompromised individuals uh, can inhale one of those spores and it can germinate in the lungs and turn into a fungal ball. So see that in immunocompromised individuals um, in intravenous drug users or on those and on the molds on histoplasma this is one option you can research in our discussion. Yeast infections like um, Candida, candidiasis, is a vaginal yeast infection, and thrush is, thrush is an oral yeast infection. This is candida, is our number one cause of fungal infections. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in humans. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Cryptococcus will let you go and read those agricultural impacts and that is it so hopefully that gets you through um, the rest of chapter three and five thank you